One of the most important principles of biblical interpretation is to keep in mind the context of what you are trying to interpret. There is a wise adage that says, a text without a context is a pretext. But grammatical context is not the only context we need to be aware of. There is also cultural context, historical context, geographical context, among others. For a fascinating discussion of biblical context, stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. My colleague Nathan Jones and I have a very special guest with us today. His name is Doug Greenwald. He is a down to earth Bible scholar who serves as the senior teaching fellow for a ministry called Preserving Bible Times. Welcome to Christ in Prophecy, brother. Well, thank you. Does that mean that most people are up in the sky and flying down to <laughs> earth, or what? I don't know. <laughs> Nathan? Uh, well, good to have you on, sir. Thank you. Thank Great you so to much. Be here. Well, supposedly, if you're successful in real estate, then you know the term location, location, location. Sure do. And when I go to your website at preservingbibletimes.org, <laughs> it looks like your theme is context, context, context. The motto of your website is actually because context matters. So, if you could tell us a little about your ministry and why context is so important to your ministry. You know, context factors in everything we do in life. Yes. Take a look at Washington, D.C. as we speak. Confirmation hearings, right? Everybody's doing background stories and research and trying to get every detail of a person's life to understand the essence of who is it we're thinking of confirming, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our professions all require background and context. Somehow we have this marvelous capability of unplugging that thought when we come to the Scriptures. Mm -hmm. Yes. And if we do have a notion of context, because I never met a pastor who said he didn't teach in context, the issue is how big is your understanding of context? Usually it's pretty anecdotal, pretty partial, and that's the challenge, you know. We got to get from what we see on top of the iceberg and realize that 90% of the iceberg is still below the waterline, and we have to discover that context as well. I noticed on your website, your emphasis of your ministry is restoring the historical, cultural, literary, visual, and geographical context of a passage so we can understand it as a Middle Eastern villager would have first understood it. This gets us closer to the original meaning of a passage, therefore closer to the Spirit's intended transformation. That's a lot of context. That's a lot of context. <laughs> you, you must cover a lot of different topics. Uh, about 18 different aspects of context, if you really want to know, okay. from geology, uh, soil, rocks, difference between hard limestone and soft limestone. There's lots of pieces to this. But what we, we are is we're weavers. We're taking all these contextual threads from the clues that were given in the text by the words that the author uses and weaving it back together. And this is what it's all about, the quest for the original meaning of the passage. Well, give us yes. an example. Well, the original meaning of a passage, let's first catch up here, is where the transformational power is going to be found, okay? When we're way out here, we can be existential. You know, I really, can I use you for a foil? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if we and I talk about a passage and you say, uh, Doug, this is what I think it means. You know what my reaction is going to be? And this is hyperbole, right? David, I don't care what you think it means. Mm -hmm. What I want to know is what did the Holy Spirit intend this passage to say? Okay. Yes. And once you and I are clear about that, then I'm intensely interested in now what you think it means and how it speaks to you. Mm -hmm. Did I make my point? Yes. See, that's original meaning. There is so much, I think this is what the passage says going on today. There's so much, I'm going to use the passage as a trampoline to go off into my favorite themes and teach something, okay? Or to mm -hmm. prove my pet theory. Exactly, yes, as you yeah. said, a proof text and a pretext <laughs> context, okay? That's what's going on. So, the original meaning of a passage, if you weave together all those pieces, it starts to jump out at you like 3D versus one dimensional. Well, give mm -hmm. us an example from the scriptures. Okay. In Luke 5, Jesus encounters Simon. And Simon has fished all night and caught nothing. Key word night. And the reason they fish at night is because they're dealing with linen nets. 
You ever thought about that? No. Okay. Well, let's, let's dig into that. The thing we know about linen, it's made from the flax fiber. The longer it's in the water, the weaker it becomes. That's why if you fish all night, you've saturated your nets. Your lifestyle is to go back in on daybreak, and you dry and rack and clean your nets, and you go out at night. Why are you fishing at night? Because fish can see linen nets. Did you know that? No, I did not know that. <laughs> all right. Okay. I wonder what fish they interviewed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, get the story here. Okay. The dumbest okay. thing you could ever do is fish during the day I see. with your yeah. nets. Everybody knows that doesn't work. Okay. So now Simon has fished all night. He's caught nothing, right? And Jesus says, uh, Simon, can I use your boat? And Simon says, sure. And Jesus basically says, no, I don't just don't want your boat. I want you on your boat. Jesus doesn't want our possessions. He wants us, Okay. And here's Simon's problem now. He's worked all night and caught nothing. He's dead tired. His lifestyle is go to bed as fast as you can. And Jesus says, what? Can I use your boat? And will you be with me in the boat? Problem. Rabbis teach for, for as long as anyone will listen. They're not like Western evangelical pastors who speak for 22 minutes and make three points. Okay? Mm -hmm. He's in for a three-hour deal. <laughs> and then, and this is where it starts the climax here. I say it's about one in the afternoon. Jesus finally says our equivalent of amen in Aramaic. And Simon says, man, I got to get a quick nap here before we go out and fish you. Simon, get your nets and go out into the deep for a catch. Now, you following me here? Yes. Makes no sense to him. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Nor does it make any sense to all the crowd who's just been listening to Jesus, who just heard this, half of which know Simon well. Simon knows this will never work, okay? Jesus puts his pride on the line, his reputation. This is an honor and shame culture. If Simon actually accedes to Jesus' command and goes out and does it and it doesn't work, he will never hear the end of this for the rest of his life. Okay? But his nets aren't dry. If on the remote possibility they would actually catch fish, the nets would break. And so Jesus is asking him to put the assets of the business at risk to submit to his command. Okay? Now, you're starting to see more of the depth of the story here? Fascinating. Do you know what Jesus is doing? He's attacking Simon. He's addressing Simon at his core competency, fishing. If there's one thing that Simon knows well, it's how to fish on the Sea of Galilee. Don't tell me what I know best. Don't mess with my core competency, okay? If there's one thing I can lean on in life to get through to make it, it's how to fish. You're a great teacher. You speak with an authority like no other. But leave me alone when it comes to <laughs> fishing, okay? And what Jesus is doing, because you see he's going to call him to be a disciple, that unless we start, Simon, with the best of who you are, not the least of who you are, you will never be a fruitful fisher of men. Unless your core competency is submitted to me at the beginning, at the get-go, you'll never be a fruitful fisher of men. Now huh. we're getting into the original meaning of the passage. Mm -hmm. Because the context opens it up for us. And I imagine that uh, Peter was very astonished when he caught fish. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and what's really fascinating again in the text, it says he beckoned to his partners to come help him with the load. He didn't shout. Why would a fisherman never shout on a lake? I got a whole bunch of great fish here. <laughs> Scare them all. Don't away. disclose a fishing hole to your competitors, <laughs> oh, okay? okay. His humanity is in the text. <laughs> so he's doing this. Well, Peter is in his humanity a lot through his life. <laughs> yes, and what's interesting in that Luke 5 passage, he starts out as Simon. The Semitic root word means yes. pebble. Yes. Then he becomes Simon Peter after he says, Woe is me, I am a sinful man. Peter, Cephas, rock. The transition from pebble to rock is already underway just in the word use of that passage. Well, that's absolutely mm -hmm. fascinating. How about giving us another example in about two and a half minutes here? <laughs> well, let's talk about John the Baptist. Okay. okay. Now, we in the West think, well, Baptist. Yeah, he baptized Jesus, right? <laughs> no, he, he didn't baptize Jesus. If you could go, you and I could go back in a time warp here to Ein Karim, where tradition says he and Elizabeth and Zechariah lived, okay, the hometown of John the Baptist. Yes. And we walked into City Lamb and said, We want to talk with John the Baptist. Where is he? They would be clueless. They had no idea what we're talking about. They don't use that language, okay? And think about it for a moment. 
We only have one understanding of baptism. Yes. Believer baptism. Was Jesus an unbeliever? Did John need to baptize him into the faith? That's our only understanding of baptism, okay? Mm -hmm. If you think about it, that's really a puzzling use of words. But if you go back to the first century, they don't use the word baptize. They use the word immerse. Mm -hmm. And there are five reasons you immerse somebody in this culture, not just one. Yes, there's proselyte baptism for a Gentile who wants to become a member of the faith, okay? Then there's ritual purification, when you go into the baths to, to purify yourself. Then you immerse yourself if you want to commit yourself to a rabbi's teaching. Mm -hmm. You uh, immerse yourself if you want to make a Nazarite vow. And here's the fifth and last reason you immerse someone, to consecrate them unto ministry. Mm -hmm. That's what John, the immerser, did for Jesus. Right. And so there's an example, again, just by the language in the word, in our limited understanding of a word, we miss the whole point of what's and going on. And it's uh, the reason that when you go to archaeological excavations in Israel, particularly, uh, 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 well, even a village or a uh, home of a wealthy person, they always have their private mikvah, mikvah, where they do purification cleansings. And here's what's fascinating. The rabbis have said, that water that's in the ritual purification has to be moving. Mm -hmm. Water has to be flowing in at the same time water is flowing out mm -hmm. because it has to carry away your mm -hmm. impurities, okay? You cannot have stagnant water. Which is the reason some early Christian groups took the position you had to be baptized in a river. Had to. Yes, and there's some real issues there. Where in the Jordan? <laughs> yes. Because downstream from where the Yarmouk River drains out of the Decapolis, yes. Where they flushed fetal remains mm -hmm. in the sewers, that could be very well have been viewed as unclean water. So you'd want to be baptized in the northern part of the Jordan. That's just a whole technical discussion, yeah. but it's really fascinating. And when you start to go into some of these little towns, you begin to discover hydraulic systems five, six, seven miles away that they're bringing in water mm -hmm. to make sure it's moving. Yes. Technically, the word is living water. Mm -hmm. John yes. four. Okay. Yes. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our interview of Doug Greenwald, the Senior Teaching Fellow for a ministry called Preserving Bible Times. Doug, uh, before we continue with our discussion of context, I, I'd like to just pause for a moment and let us uh, know a little bit about your background. Tell us about your background. Well, I, I'd like to be thought of as Exhibit A of the priesthood of all believers. Okay, okay? <laughs> okay that's good. I'm trained as an engineer. All right. Uh, I got a couple degrees of that, and then I got a business degree because I figured out I didn't like engineering. <laughs> and along about, I'm age 38 years old, and uh, I relocate to East Lansing, Michigan from Rochester, New York, and in August of 1979, we go to church on a Sunday morning, almost our first Sunday in town, sit in the back row of a church. Yeah. You got to have an exit strategy when you're in a new <laughs> church, you know. So I'm sitting in the back row, and I hear a sermon on spiritual gifts from Pastor Tom. Now, I've been an elder twice and a deacon once in the various denominations. I've never heard of this. Huh. Is that right? And lo and behold, it's, it's in the book, you know, <laughs> in at least three different places. So I'm fascinated by this. And when the service is over, I tap the people in front of me because nobody's in back of me. I said, have you ever heard this subject before? <laughs> I said, oh, yeah. He teaches this subject every six months. He doesn't want anybody in this church not to know about vocation, avocation, destiny, edification, calling, you know, spiritual gifts, etc. Okay? And it turns out everybody in the church knows their spiritual gifts. Everybody's involved in ministry. Everybody has a mentor. I mean, it was fascinating. Wow, fantastic. Never seen a church like it. Okay? Well, after three or four months, my wife and I decided we wanted to join this church, but you can't just join it. Among other things, you have to do a spiritual gift workshop on a Saturday. Okay? So, did mine. And my Houts Pro, Pro questionnaire comes out at like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and Pastor Tom said, huh, teaching, wisdom, knowledge, and some form of discernment. My, my, my. <laughs> I want you to start teaching the graduate students at Michigan State University <laughs> <laughs> on the Gospel of John. Yeah. If you need any help, let me know. I'll be your mentor. Just like that. Just like that. And this is, that's the absolute truth. So, other than panic, I mean, what would you do? <laughs> <What a> panic. <laughs> yeah. I ran down to my local Christian bookstore and said, where's the commentary section? Yes. Now, where are the J's, you know? 
What? She only got seven? I need at least 12, because if Jesus had 12 disciples, I figure there's some safety in 12 commentaries, right? <laughs> and I got all the classics. But what I didn't know is none of those 12 classics had ever been to Israel. Huh. Okay? So I began to teach the only way I knew how to teach, cut and paste. Take the best of the, the 12, mm -hmm. smash it all together, right? And go to class. And so after three years, we were halfway through the fifth chapter of John. <laughs> and I decided, why are we in a hurry? <laughs> why are we in a hurry? I mean, if you discover a rosebud, slow down and let that rosebud open oh. to see its fragrance, its multi layers of petals, its real beauty. Why are we teaching people to hop from rosebud to rosebud to rosebud? Or another example I like to use. Why are we teaching people to water ski across the surface of the scriptures when what we really need to do is teach them how to scuba dive, get below the surface? Okay. Yes. Okay? Yes. So I taught that way for 10 years, cut and paste. I got transferred to Washington, D.C. in 1988. A year later, off to Israel, 45 of us from our church went with Dr. James Martin, who's a protege of Jim Fleming, the godfather of the Christian study movement in Israel, in Jerusalem. Okay? About the third day on the trail, I had my woe is me moment, like Isaiah. How did we miss this? Why didn't somebody tell me? Can I literally go back and reteach 10 years worth of lessons? I just taught them one dimensionally. Mm -hmm. And I discovered Kenneth Bailey and Alfred Edersheim and Jeremias and those kind of guys on that trip and began to just pour myself into the study of biblical context. Okay? And my vocation changed. Teaching God's Word in context became my vocation. Sales and marketing now was my avocation, and it's been that way ever since. And the nice thing about understanding your spiritual gifts, when you retire, you pursue them full time. There you go. Fascinating. <laughs> you, we've had James Fleming on our, our television have show, you? and he's oh, yeah. brought Bible Times and yes. Archaeology Life. We have our ministry supports trips to Israel, and I've been there a few times, Dr. Reagan, 40 some times, and each time it has made the Bible come to life. So. I want to hear more about your context. Why context is so important to understanding the scriptures? Because it really is. You have more examples? Tell us how to approach a, a passage. Well, I yeah. will. You see, one of the things we're trying to do at Preserving Bible Times is give people the Israel experience while never leaving the church. Yeah, because not everybody can go to Israel. Yeah, right? so we took seven years to film all of Israel's biblical sites. 172 sites are down on DVDs. So I can teach you biblical geography more effectively in, in the United States in a church basement than if I went to Israel for four weeks with you. Okay? okay. And I can use this footage to set the stage for any passage in a church. And so part of our vision here is to help people have the Israel experience because 95% of the people will never get there. It'll make the Bible come alive to them when they read passages. Exactly. Now, here's yeah. one of the things Western evangelicalism has missed in a big way. We teach people a thousand facts when they t we take them to Israel, mm -hmm. but we don't teach them frameworks as to how to make sense of all these facts, how to organize them together. So, one of the things we do is to teach people different frameworks to get more miles per gallon from their Bible study. And I'm going to now give you the front end framework. Okay. okay. The five questions that I like to ask of any passage, anytime, anywhere. Okay. The first one is really complex. Where are we? That's a geography question. Mm -hmm. You got to have an understanding of geography. Yes. The second question then is, what's happened here before? That's a history question. You know, when you have a country that's only as big as Vermont, with thousands of years of history, lots of things tend to happen in the same place, just mm -hmm. in different eras. And the past is often prologue to the present passage. So, knowing what happened before is often a part of what's being said today. Okay? Yes. Then the, the third question is, what contextual clues does the Bible writer give us with the names, the sites, the places, the verbs, the nouns, the idioms that are in the text? Okay? All of those words are there for a reason to give us clues. Mm -hmm. Then the fourth thing we want to ask is, is what literary clues are we given? And then the very last one is, what does the site look like? That's why we want to be visual. 50% okay? of the people in the world are visual, not auditory. we we got to deal with that. Okay? So that's pretty simple, right? Just ask those five questions. You'll be amazed at what that will do for your Bible study. So let me take the first one. Where are we? That's geography. Okay? Exodus 3.8, the land flowing with milk and honey. Right? We're familiar with that phrase. That speaks to geography. 
because if I took you to the north of Israel, it's green, great soil. If I took you to the Samaritan hill country in the middle, rocky, rugged, uh, terraced. If I take you to Beersheba in the south, flat, tan, six to eight inches of rainfall, okay? Mm -hmm. That is the land of milk and honey. So when I say milk to you Westerners, your instant reaction is? Cows. Cows, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's goats. Goats are the perfect animal for the southern part of this country. They okay. can go long periods of time without water. Oh, yeah. They'll eat anything, even uh, the weeds, uh, dead roots of weeds, dead weeds, okay? They will produce 40% more volume of milk than a sheep and have 35% higher butterfat contact, which makes for cheeses and yogurts, which is wonderful for a migratory people, okay? So in that phrase, the land of milk and honey, milk is goats, the south. Honey now is the north, where it's green. That's where the date palms were first indigenous. If you take dates and smash them up enough and do some other things to it, it becomes sort of a syrupy thing, which was known as honey. So the land of milk and honey is the land of goats and date palms. It's the land of green and tan. It's the land of shepherds and farmers, okay? All of that's in that phrase. Now, here's what's really fascinating. The nature and character of the land tends to shape the spiritual destiny of the people in it, okay? Take, let's go to the divided kingdom period, right? Mm -hmm. 19 monarchs in the north, all of them apostate. Down in the south, we got 19 or 20, depending on how you count them. 11 of the 19, like Hezekiah's, are faithful to Yahweh, okay? Can you explain that by the geography of this land? Yes, you can. Can you? Because in the north, who needs God? I got great land, I got fertile soil, I've got great rain, I can take care of myself. If you live in the south, you're 90 days removed from a disaster if there's an insect infestation or a drought, okay? And so you better live close to Yahweh. Here's the point. That phrase comes with a spiritual challenge as well, the land of milk and honey, because we have to, many of us live in the green, economically speaking. It's wealthy. That's right. It's green. And yet we have to live as if we were in the South, totally dependent, totally sustained by the Lord, even though we live in the midst of the green. That's the, the spiritual challenge that comes with the phrase, the land of milk and honey. It's rooted in understanding the geography. And then your second question was, what's happened here before, right? Great second question. Okay. Let me take you to Luke 7. Jesus has got his band. He comes to the village of Nain. He sees a, a funeral procession. And we're told that the only son of the widow of Nain had just died and on the bier, and they're being carried him to his grave. You have to bury them in the first day. Jesus walks up and basically touches that bier, makes himself totally unclean, unclean yeah. brings the young man back to life, okay? And the people say this, in Luke 7, 16. Fear gripped them all, and they began glorifying God, saying, a great prophet has risen amongst us. Now, why would they say that? Hmm. Because if we ask the question, what's happened here before? We're on the hill of Mora in Nain. A quarter mile away, around the, around the edge here of the hill of Mora, is the remains of the ancient city of Shuman, where 700 years before, Elisha did the same thing for the Shumanite woman. Interesting. Huh. What's happened here before? The exact same thing. And that's why they say this is a great prophet because you have a long institutional memory in the, in the Near East. They still remember Elisha as if it was yesterday, and they're associating him out with Yeshua, Jesus. And basically, Jesus reprises the same thing in the same place. Okay? Fascinating. Yep. Fascinating. Or right, another of those five. Culture. What cultural clues are we given? And I can, I can be fast on this, all right? <laughs> We're told that Jesus healed the man with the withered right hand. Yes. This is very significant, the word right. Because you see, in this culture, this is your unclean hand. That's it's right. the hand yeah. for your bodily functions. Yes. This is the hand you eat with and you embrace somebody with. And if this is unclean, guess what? You're on the outside looking in. That's right. It's all wrapped up in this word right. Okay? We talked about the significance of the word night in the fishing scene. Okay? Mm -hmm. Understanding what kind of nets that they have. We're told that the leper was covered with leprosy, which probably means he's near death, okay? There are all these little words, uh, cultural clues that were given that matter. And that's what we have to be sensitive to because it's part of the tapestry of weaving the whole story back together. Another one. Well, uh, let's do number four. What literary things do we look for, okay? A very common thing that's going on here, the rabbis teach with something called a remez, R-E-M-E-Z. It means to hearken back to, okay? 
when all the young boys from 5 to 13 have learned to memorize their Old Testament scriptures, you speak in shorthand if you're a rabbi because everybody knows the longhand meaning. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Okay. And so, from a prophetic perspective, in Matthew and in Luke, Jesus will often say, I am the Son of Man. Yes. Well, that's a it. deliberate hearkening back to Daniel 7. That's right. Okay. Where the fuller meaning of the Son of Man is developed. And they knew that. And they knew it cold. They knew the full weight of that, and they all imported that into that little phrase. And they knew he was claiming to be Messiah. When exactly. He said that. That's He's why they not wanted to kill him. About it. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> exactly. Sometimes there's an action remez. Remember in John when they brought the woman committing adultery, or supposedly did, and it said that Jesus is writing in the earth? There's been a lot of speculation, a lot of wild speculation. Well, what was he writing? But if you view it as an action remez, deliberately hearkening back to something in the past, you might be, remember, in Jeremiah 17, 13, I will write the names of my enemies in the dust of the earth. Okay? Hmm. So, over 300 times there are verbal remez in the Gospels, and there's about 80 to 100 action remez in the Gospels. Mary's Magnificat is just one, is a cascade of remez. Zechariah's Benedictus is a cascade of remez. There's 26 remez just in Luke 1. Okay? And so that's a very simple but very powerful technique to help in the interpretive component of what's the original meaning of these passages. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and our interview with Doug Greenwall about the importance of context and understanding the Bible. Doug, you've been a joy and a blessing. Thanks for being with us. And tell our viewers how they can get in touch with you. Well, if they just go to preservingbibletimes.org, you will find a wealth of resources from DVDs to books to publications to articles. You can even sign up for our monthly bi uh, reflection newsletter. Thank you, Doug. Well, folks, that's our program for today. I hope it's been a blessing to you, and I hope you'll be back with us again next week, the Lord willing. Until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, Look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. How did people live in the time of Jesus? The DVD set, Life in Bible Times, will help you understand biblical stories and gain knowledge about the culture of the time. This one hour and 45 minute video album contains four television programs on two DVD discs. The first program features agricultural techniques. The second program tells the importance of city gates both for external defense and for internal governance. The third program is about the Last Supper Jesus had with his disciples and how the actual event was very different from the famous portrayal painted by Leonardo da Vinci. The fourth program concerns crucifixion and burial customs. The album also contains bonus footage that was not included in the four television programs. All the programs feature the anointed teaching of Dr. Jim Fleming. You can get a copy of the album for a donation of $20 or more. That includes the cost of shipping. To order, call the number you see on the screen or order online at lamblion.com. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus. 